first airplanes were land-based. But it soon became apparent to designers that if their aircraft could land on water, they would not be dependent on landing grounds and could travel much further afield. Frenchman Henri Fabre was the first man to fly a powered aircraft from water. On the 28th of March 1910, Fabre's hydroplane Le Canard flew four perfect flights from the waters of the Etang de Berre near Marseille. American pioneer Glenn Curtis paid close attention to this feat and forged an early partnership with the US Navy, which was interested in the potential military use of flying boats. Curtis attached custom-built floats to his Model D biplane, which became patented as a hydro aeroplane. At an aviation meet in 1911, he had the chance to demonstrate its potential when a monoplane crashed into Lake Michigan. The Curtis swiftly sped from its hangar, flew towards the stricken aircraft and alighted close by. Curtis rivals the Wright brothers also forged ahead with seaplane development. Their first was a version of the Model C biplane mounted on a single wide pontoon with another pontoon supporting the rudder. As World War I progressed, seaplanes became bigger and more ambitious. By the end of the war, they were among the largest aeroplanes in the world, ideally placed to attempt distance records. A short seaplane was the first aircraft to attack a ship with a live torpedo, and the British company moved into passenger aircraft following the end of hostilities. It was the dawn of the airline industry, and flying boats were ideally positioned as they could accommodate large numbers of passengers and only required a smooth body of water on which to land. To demonstrate the potential of long-distance flight, three NC Curtis flying boats took off from New York in May 1919 on an attempt to cross the Atlantic. NC-1 was caught in bad weather off the coast of the Azores and had to be abandoned by its crew. NC-3 was also damaged by the weather and floated for 48 hours until the tides swept it into harbor. Only NC-4 remained airworthy to claim the honor of the world's first transatlantic flight. 19 days after leaving America, the Curtis flew into Lisbon, then on to England, where they were greeted by enthusiastic crowds. The Ferry Aviation Company was another business that specialized in impressive float planes. In 1920, the company unveiled the Ferry 3D, a big biplane that could be fitted with either floats or a wheeled undercarriage. The launch model was powered by a 375 horsepower Rolls-Royce Eagle engine, while later versions used the 450 horsepower Napier Lion. The 3D was snapped up by navies around the world, including Australia, and one was awarded the Britannia Trophy for circumnavigating Australia in 1924. The aeroplane covered 8,568 miles in 90 flying hours across uncharted territories. It was acclaimed in the press as the finest flight in the history of aviation. Portugal used its Ferry 3D in an attempt to cross the South Atlantic. The float plane reached Las Palmas, San Vicente and Cape Verde, but was lost when it made a refueling stop at the St. Peter and Paul Rocks in Brazil. The RAF Cape flight flew four 3Ds from Cairo to Cape Town and return. The first long-range formation flight by the RAF and the fleet's first flight to South Africa. The company's Ferry Fremantle was commissioned as a long-range aircraft with the capacity to circumnavigate the globe. The Fremantle was the largest single-engine float seaplane that had been produced in the world up to that point. It had a cruising range of 1,100 miles and a top speed of 100 miles per hour. The Fremantle featured a Rolls-Royce Condor engine and carried a large wireless cabin aft of the pilot's cockpit. In the 1920s, polar adventurers such as Richard Byrd tested the boundaries of the world. 
Legendary explorer Roald Amundsen took a Latham 47 seaplane with him on an expedition to the North Pole in 1928. Together with pilots Leif Dietrichsen and René Guibo and three others, Amundsen embarked on a rescue mission to save crew members of the Nobile airship that had crashed onto pack ice. Sadly, the rescue mission itself came to grief when the Latham plunged into the Barents Sea, possibly after encountering fog. A life raft made from one of the seaplane's pontoons was later found. None of the crew was ever found. Another polar explorer who used the versatility of seaplanes was Australian Hubert Wilkins. Wilkins became a pilot during the First World War and continued his flying career in the 1920s, making the first flight across the Arctic in 1928 with Ben Eielson in a custom-built Lockheed Vega dubbed Los Angeles. Wilkins was a trained engineer who was also interested in photography, cinematography and natural science. He published a book titled Undiscovered Australia that catalogued the many rare tropical plants, animals, fossils and artefacts he collected for the British Museum in the 1920s. Wilkins took two Lockheed Vegas on his expedition to Antarctica in 1928, and Eielson made the world's first flight over the icy continent in Los Angeles. When San Francisco, the second Vega, was ready, both planes took to the air. Unfortunately, the Los Angeles wheels skidded on the ice and it tumbled into the water on landing. Eielson was unhurt, but it took quite an effort to recover the Vega. Floats were then attached to the aircraft to allow water takeoffs and landings, but rowdy seabirds made it impossible for the aeroplanes to take off safely. Wheels were reattached and a proper landing strip cleared along the beach. Since the mid-twenties, Britain's Air Ministry had been carrying out tests on all-metal seaplanes. Its prototype monoplane featured twin engines and a streamlined design. Metal hulls were about 25% lighter than wooden ones, and when the water soakage of a wooden hull was taken into account, the weight saving was even greater. The wooden Cromarty flying boat, built in 1920, absorbed more than 600 pounds of water into her planking after just a few weeks in service. All metal construction also guaranteed watertight joints, making it unnecessary to use a bilge pump to remove excess water. The Blackburn Dart torpedo bomber was wheeled out of the hangar in the early 1920s. Unusually for its time, the biplane was designed with two bay equal span wings that were staggered and swept. It was powered by either a high-powered Napier Lion 2B or V engine, enabling it to carry a significant load. With floats attached, the seaplane variant was a tractor biplane, with two floats of boat-built construction extending far enough behind to make a tail float redundant. It was so well trimmed at takeoff speed that the pilot could take his hands off the controls and still remain steady. Wheels fitted to the undercarriage were not intended to be used for landing, but for transporting the seaplane across the ground once it had landed on water. The biplane's wings were made of wood, designed to be foldable, and the fuselage was part wood, part metal. The machine was very stable on the water, as the strut attachments were partly direct to the fuselage and partly direct at the point of attachment of the sloping outrigger struts. Its top speed was about 100 miles an hour and the rate of climb at sea level approximately 600 feet a minute. In 1925, English aeroplane designer Reginald Mitchell constructed the Schneider S4 Supermarine prototype. The high-speed seaplane was intended to compete in the Schneider Trophy air race, 
a French competition that awarded £1,000 to the team that flew the fastest, most seaworthy amphibious aeroplane. In 1921, the Supermarine Sea Lion II, another Mitchell design, had won the trophy, despite being less technologically developed than other seaplanes in the competition. The S4 was far more advanced, featuring the cantilevered designs pioneered by Hugo Junkers and a single engine, the Napier Lion 7. Unfortunately, the S4 crashed and was destroyed during trials in Baltimore. Pilot H.C. Bayard survived. But the lessons learned from its development were incorporated into future Mitchell designs, including the legendary Spitfire. Next off the blocks was the Supermarine S5, created for the 1927 trophy race. Mitchell made the wing lower than the S4, and wing surface radiators replaced the Lamblin radiators of the original design. But the Napier Lion engine remained, and S5 racers came first and second in the air race. Flight Lieutenant Webster flew the winning aeroplane at an average speed of 282 miles an hour. Advances in float plane technology made amphibian planes increasingly popular for passenger services. Erignon introduced a service from France to England using a Shrek FBA flying boat in the mid-twenties. The vessel landed on the Thames River on its arrival in London and passengers disembarked onto rowing boats. On the continent, the Dornier DOJ set the standard for twin-engined flying boats. Designed by Germany's Claude Dornier, the whale had to be manufactured in Italy to comply with the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, which forbade a German aviation industry. Rugged and powerful, Dornier Val flew expeditions to the most remote parts of the globe and served in several air forces. At the smaller end of the scale was the Sea Flea. Billed as half a plane, half a boat, in 1927, the tiny craft sped down the Thames at Putney at 75 miles an hour, demonstrating its aquatic abilities. Piloted by Ukrainian engineer George Degasenko, the float glider crossed the English Channel in 20 minutes, averaging 93 miles per hour. With a hull made from mahogany, drawing only three inches of water, the craft weighed only 2,000 pounds when loaded with fuel. The aircraft skimmed the water and, as it gained speed, crested the waves with perfect balance. Degasenko made an earlier attempt to travel across the Mediterranean from Marseille to Africa in the Sea Flea, but the propeller was splintered in rough seas and he had to dock for repairs. Celebrity aviator Charles Lindbergh and his wife Anne took seaplanes on some of their legendary flights to chart new airline routes. Landing on water made it possible for them to explore some of the remotest areas of the globe. Into the cockpit of his Lockheed Sirius climbs Colonel Charles Lindbergh. Mrs. Lindbergh is with him. Flying together, as always, they are heading from Washington, D.C., across the Bering Sea to Japan. A perfect landing after almost half the world has rolled by beneath their wings. Cheers and waving flags as Tokyo greets them. Colonel and Mrs. Lindbergh are starting on another and perhaps their greatest journey. A 29,000-mile survey flight from New York to Labrador, Greenland, Iceland, Europe, the Azores, Africa, Brazil, and return to New York. In 1928, the giant Rohrbach Roma was unveiled. Powered by three BMW VIUZ V piston engines, the flying boat could carry 16 passengers. Of the four produced, three were used as passenger planes on the Baltic route, and one went to the French Navy. Britain's largest all-metal flying boat, the Blackburn Iris III, was tested in 1926. Three Rolls-Royce Condor H-1B piston engines powered the massive aeroplane, which had a maximum takeoff weight of almost 30,000 pounds. The flying boat could accommodate a crew of five, and three models were built. 
The Iris Mark II was among a flotilla of flying boats that accompanied British Secretary of State for Air Samuel Hoare on an official visit to Scandinavia in 1927 to showcase Britain's amphibious technology. The Blackburn Aeroplane and Motor Company was founded by Robert Blackburn in 1914. An aviation pioneer from Yorkshire, Blackburn built his first monoplane in 1909 and his company produced a wide range of military and civilian aeroplanes. Blackburn went on to acquire the Cirrus Hermes Company in 1937, adding engines to its manufacturing stable. Britain's first aircraft factory was founded by the Short brothers, Oswald, Horace, and Eustace, in 1908. The brothers moved into flying boat manufacture in the 1920s and produced several notable aircraft, including the Short S11 Valletta. The Short Valletta monoplane is the biggest seaplane in the world. The term seaplane is used to indicate marine aircraft with twin floats or pontoons and to distinguish it from what is known as a flying boat. The total flying weight of the Valletta is approximately 22,000 pounds, so that it compares in size and weight with the largest of flying boats, except the experimental German flying boat known as the DOX. Powered by three Bristol Jupiter XIF engines, the Valletta could carry two crew and 16 passengers, making it ideal for exploring the far reaches of the world. In 1931, pilot Alan Cobham flew the aeroplane from England to the Congo to survey a proposed Imperial Airways route connecting Central Africa to the Mediterranean. The all-metal twin float monoplane performed admirably on the 12,300 mile flight, demonstrating the advantages of taking flying boats into remote areas. On its return, it was converted to a land plane, ending its days as an instructional aircraft with the Royal Air Force. In 1930, a Dornier Val, under the command of pilot Wolfgang von Gronau, took off from Germany on its way around the world, in the process completing the first east-west flight across the Atlantic. It was a proud moment for aficionados of flying boats when the grand airliner glided onto the waters of Manhattan Harbor. Another aeroplane well suited for long distance travel was the Dornier DOX. Like Claude Dornier's Val flying boat, the DOX featured sponsons rather than wingtip floats. Dornier saw his flying boat as the aeroplane of the future. The enormous wings spanned 157 feet. Above them were 12 Siemens Jupiter engines, controlled by an engineer whose control room was set behind the enclosed flight deck. Instead of throttles, the pilot told the engineer how much power he needed, and the engineer and his assistant pulled the levers. The X was the biggest flying boat of its age, and became the pride of Germany's air fleet. 
It could carry 70 passengers comfortably, but on October the 21st, 1929, it took off from Lake Constance with a world record 169 people and flew for 40 minutes. Its luxurious accommodation included three decks with spacious cabins, convertible sleeping quarters, and crew rooms. The airplane was so heavy that passengers were all asked to move to one side of the cabin when it needed to make a turn. In 1930, the Jupiter power plants were replaced by Curtis Conqueror water-cooled engines, enabling the flying boat to climb to 1,650 feet, considered to be a safe altitude to cross the Atlantic. The proving flight turned out to be something of a party. It's a delicate task piloting the world's largest flying boat with 60 passengers aboard. The engineers in the control room send the 12 motors which have carried them on their 11,000 mile circular tour. And access to the engines is through one of the giant 78 foot wings. And in the spacious saloon, passengers could enjoy a last drink poured from the bar as they headed towards New York and Prohibition. The British Short S-17 Kent was another flying boat that offered the highest standard of service. Three aircraft were built, including the Satyrus, which was launched in 1931. The Satyrus flew to the Mediterranean, India, South Africa and Australia, and boasted a cabin that was even quieter than a railway carriage. The short S-23 Empire flying boats were developed in response to the British government's decision to send all international mail by air. Imperial Airways commissioned 28 of the long-range flying boats that could carry 24 passengers and had a 700-mile range. At Rochester a few short months ago, experts were busy building a new type of giant flying boat. It was the beginnings of the Canopus, Imperial Airways passenger plane destined for service over the Empire air routes. The next stage was when the proud new ship was brought out for trials, which she passed with honours until at last she was ready for her maiden voyage. And so at last the Canopus took off, bound for the east, a proud unit in Britain's air transport overseas. Canopus made its first flight on the 4th of July 1936 and was soon taking passengers on luxury flights to far-flung corners of the British Empire. Arriving at Codebeck on the Seine on the first lap of its journey to the east, Britain's giant flying liner Canopus, making a safety first flight, not attempting to break any records. An Empire Air Mail function attended by Sir Kingsley Wood and by Sir John Reith, new chief of Imperial Airways. From now on, mail may be sent to Australia by air at the rate of a penny halfpenny per half ounce. It is also a regular service to New Zealand, Tasmania, the Fiji Islands and New Guinea. We have travelled far from the days of the horse-drawn mail coach and the steam packet. Correspondence crosses the world by flying boat in days instead of months. Into the evening sun, the Empire flying boat takes off on the first experimental air service from Sydney, New South Wales to Southampton, the world's longest air route in 85 flying hours and the steamships take six weeks. Australian airline Qantas operated a luxury service to England that could carry 15 passengers, five crew, and 3,000 pounds of mail and cargo. Over Sydney, its gigantic harbour, over the bridge that is the pride of Australia. And aboard this 60,000 pound flying hotel, life is smooth and comfortable. The hours pass luxuriously in almost silent safety. Away from the Australian coast, out across the Timor Sea, heading for home. But although the C-Series flying boats were able to fly as far as the Antipodes with stops, they did not have the range to fly regular services across the Atlantic, to the British government's great embarrassment. The Caledonia was stripped down to the bare essentials and sent on non-stop flights, but incapable of carrying much cargo. Imperial Airways flying boat Caledonia lay ready for her crew to begin the greatest commercial flight yet attempted. At points on the west coast of Ireland, Master Pilot Wilcoxon and his crew were given a send-off by President de Valera, and the surprisingly large number of spectators who had journeyed to this lonely spot to watch the making of air history. The Atlantic flyers went aboard their huge plane, the engines roared into life, and she took off into the west for Newfoundland.
But there was also a reminder that the Americans had already established a link across the Atlantic via their clipper service. And the following day, the Pan American clipper came marching into view, punctual and steady as a train, to drop gracefully onto the water for a perfect landing at the end of her 2,000 mile hop out of the Western world. Captain Gray of the Clipper came ashore with his crew, having passed the Caledonia in mid-Atlantic, and so concluded a magnificent achievement of commercial flying, the four regular passenger services across the forbidding Atlantic. Short came up with a bizarre solution to carrying a proper payload across the Atlantic. Pickerback flying is a stage nearer, and the upper section of this composite aircraft will rest on top of the lower plane, and at Rochester, the upper component is nearing completion. The superstructure of the lower component can be seen as the plane is out for test, and both sections have four engines, making an eight-engine plane of unusual design. The object of the experiment is to enable a plane to take off carrying sufficient petrol for a 3,000-mile flight, and the designer, Major Mayo, eagerly looks on. The short S-21 Maya and the S-20 Mercury pairing was an innovative solution. The Maya composite plane was separated the other day, and of course we had to be present at this new kind of wedding ceremony. After being divorced by circumstances, Maya and Mercury are happily reunited. Now let's hope some nice airliner will make an honest woman of the Caledonia. Now the miracle of aviation is ready for a second flight. What do you say? Blooming thing's fallen off the top. All right, we were only fooling. So watch once more how Maya lifts herself and Mercury up into the sky in another superb takeoff. Being air launched from the Maya gave the smaller seaplane the range to reach Canada en route to the United States. New York City. Mercury, the top half of the famous pickerback plane, came down safely on the waters of Manhasset Bay. Under her pilot, Captain Bennett, she had crossed from Ireland in 25 hours by way of Montreal. In her cargo were copies of Gilman British News. Well, I'm very happy to have brought to America the films of the King's visit to Paris and to have done so the day after his visit. I hope that it will do something to bring the English-speaking peoples together. 24 years and 50,000 flights ago, the China Clipper left San Francisco, headed westward on the first scheduled flight across any major ocean. The classic flying boat was luxurious for its day, not bad even by current standards. It was American flying boats that set the standard in the 1930s. Pan American Airways made the first commercial flight across the Pacific in 1935, using a China Clipper Martin M130 flying boat, the most luxurious of its day. The sturdy all-metal aircraft had a double-bottomed hull and small sea wings under the fuselage that were connected to the main wing by struts and kept the airplane stable in the water. The China Clipper took off from the waters of San Francisco Bay over the then under construction Golden Gate Bridge and on to Hawaii, en route to Manila. It foreshadowed a golden age of passenger transport. For the next few years, Pan Am's clippers took passengers around the world. We see that on your ship, 
The Union Jack and the Stars and Stripes are flying side by side. I am sure that we all hope, a hope which also I'm confident you share, that we shall proceed together to develop this most important air project of the transatlantic The Pan American Terminal Building in Coconut Grove, Florida was an Art Deco icon. Eagles and globes were carved into the facade, symbolizing the freedom that clippers represented to Americans. The clippers were moored to docks that extended into the bay, and passengers could wait for their flight in the restaurant or cocktail lounge at the airport. When Pan Am discontinued its flying boat service, the building became the Miami City Hall. Unfortunately, not all clippers reached their destination safely. A survey flight by the American Samoan clipper brought her down to a graceful landing on the waters of Auckland, New Zealand. But this flight had a tragic sequel. The next day the clipper left for San Francisco, and on her return flight to Auckland, she was lost in the Pacific, and her crew of seven were killed. Coinciding with the Clippers' visit, Britain's flying boat Centaurus also called in at Auckland. When aeroplanes are so much in the news, discharging their cargo of death over Spain and China, commercial aircraft is doubly welcome. But the greetings of the British and American pilots, so shortly before the death of one of them, gives a tragic reminder of the daily risks that are run by those who guide our modern transport of peace through the skies of the world. And there was the dramatic tale of the Cavalier. With the story of the modern ship, the flying boat Cavalier took off here from Port Washington on the last fatal run to Bermuda. Ice again. Her engines were failing through ice. So ran the radio message received by Pan American. Coast guards and other vessels nearby raced to help the stricken British flying boat. She was settling deeper as the day wore on. 13 souls on board, 300 miles from land. For 10 hours, 10 survivors clung to the Cavalier. Three dropped off and were drowned. Rescued by the oil tanker Baytown, they came back to New York. Great crowds had gathered on the quay to watch them come ashore. Men and women who had clung to a sinking shell in the darkness, wondering if help would come too late. 10 survivors, two wives who had seen their husbands drown. But they pay brave tribute to the men who rescued them. We had, ought to say nice things about the crew of the S.O. Bait Town. They did everything possible for our comfort. And the rescuers hand back that tribute of courage. The people that were rescued actually deserve more credit than we people here. So ends a tragedy of flight and a heroic record of endurance. Thousands pass through this unusual air terminal daily. Jeepers. Although passenger flying boats received the most attention, clippers were used to move more than people. Caribbean West Coast flyers flew thousands of chickens from the United States to South America every day. Here's a truck that has a habit of chasing planes. In fact, it's a business. All aboard Fort Cozumel, Tapachula, Guatemala, Tegucigalpa, Antifaga, or come on and get in. With the clipper ship in between, it's just two steps from the United States to any country south of the border. This truck sure is traveling, and so are its occupants, if it gets there in time. Six minutes to go, then off to South America. Step on it, driver. That airport is still a mile away. Uh-oh, and this plane waits for nobody. Right in the nick of time. These passengers just won't get ready until the last minute, and there's nothing that can be done about it. In traveling togs before they know what it's all about. Loaded into a speedy truck and rushed to the airport. Across the gangplank and into the rumble seat. A lot of fuss over a bunch of small fry, but not a peep out of them. What a passenger list. Over 800 this trip. Takeoff time for the Caribbean West Coast Flyer. Motors roar and the clipper ship express trains down the choppy water of the bay. A sweep up into the air and its nose points south. Flying down to Rio at a lot of miles per hour. Next plane leaves in 45 minutes, so back again for another load. American chicks bring home South American checks. This is one time when a dozen chickens are cheaper than a dozen eggs. Happy landings, you birds. The British launched a new monster in 1939. It was in the Golden Hind that Sir Francis Drake sailed around the world four centuries ago. This is the Golden Hind of the modern age, destined for weekly passenger or mail services across the Atlantic. 31 tons of flying boat, 
She can carry more than 150 passengers and crew. With a cruising speed of nearly 200 miles an hour, she could fly 6,000 miles without stopping. That's the kind of performance they predicted when they launched her at Rochester. The exact purpose of the Golden Hind has not yet been definitely decided, but she's a grand ship and a stately ship, so here's happy voyaging. But like its counterpart, the S-26 short Sunderland Golden Hind was destined to enter military service. With the outbreak of the Second World War, flying boats became indispensable transport planes and were even used as bombers by both sides of the conflict. The Americans had the PBY Catalina, the Germans the Dornier DO-22. The RAF depended on the short SE-5 Sunderland, a patrol bomber that stalked the seas in search of German submarines. This multi-purpose aircraft could be used for rescues and reconnaissance although it could only take off and land from sheltered coastal waters. Upon locating a U-boat, often with the assistance of radar, the Sunderland would try to drop its depth charges before the enemy submerged. These bombs would explode about 25 to 30 feet underwater and proved very effective. The first aircraft to sink a submarine without assistance was an Australian-operated Sunderland. In wartime, we have no radio to guide us. So everything depends on the navigator. Today he must lead us by dead reckoning out to an incoming convoy. And all the time we're watching for the white feather on the water that will indicate the periscope of a pirate submarine. When we sight a foreign merchantman, we take a picture which might be useful for contraband control. And when we reach the convoy, we find that three ships have lost their way. So we swoop low and signal to them the position of the rest of the convoy. We use our oldest lamp, for a radio message might be picked up by the enemy. For hour after hour, we guard the convoy, and then we turn for home. On the way back, our captain orders a practice aircraft alarm, and the guns are manned. Already the RAF have flown millions of miles on coastal patrol. They are the watchtowers of Britain's ships at sea. Germany introduced a Metox radar warning system in an attempt to evade discovery. And for a time, the Sunderland's kill rate was reduced. However, when centimetric radar was introduced in 1943, Metox stopped being effective. America's newest mystery-shrouded patrol bomber roars into the Anacostia Naval Air Station in Maryland. America's most versatile flying boat, the PBY Catalina, could be armed with depth charges, bombs, torpedoes, and M2 Browning machine guns. All branches of the American services operated the airplanes, using them for anti-submarine warfare, patrol bombing, convoy escorts, search and rescue, and cargo transport. front, there's a base for gun mounting. And as to her top speed, well, the Navy won't tell. Catalina's carried a crew of eight airmen and could carry up to 20 passengers. The RAF operated them as night intruders, painting the flying boats black. The black cats were used for laying mines and night rescues, but there was a high attrition rate. Of the 168 cats that flew for the RAF, only 23 survived the war due to the fact that they operated in the front line, but were restricted by their low speed. Today, just a handful remain in museum collections, but several are still airworthy more than 70 years after they were first launched. The United States also launched a giant of the air. A new giant joins the Navy's sky fleet, the 72-ton Mars flying boat. First of a series of 20 to be named for Pacific Islands is christened by Mrs. DeWitt Clinton Ramsey, wife of Rear Admiral Ramsey, former Naval Aeronautics Chief. As the sky giant slides down the ways at the Martin plant in Baltimore, it becomes the largest flying boat in United States service. It has a 200-foot wingspan and is 120 feet long. Powered with four motors totaling more than 8,000 horsepower, the big boat has a speed in excess of 200 miles an hour and can carry payloads of 30,000 pounds or more. Our Navy adds giant wings to the growing cloud over Japan. 
Even while the huge Mars is making her test flights, another flying colossus, still larger, is under construction at the Hughes Aircraft Company in Culver City. When completed, this flying boat, to be known as the H-4, will weigh 200 tons and be used as a super cargo carrier. Its freight space will equal that of two freight cars. The construction is almost entirely of plywood. Designer Howard Hughes staked his reputation on the airplane's success. The the More than five stories tall and with a wingspan as big as a football field, the world's largest flying boat, the H-4 or Spruce Goose, was too big to fly effectively and was mothballed after making just one short flight in 1947. Engineering advances during the war saw France make big strides in flying boat production. The Laticoère L631 Lionel de Marmier was an immense aeroplane. This giant French seaplane, powered by six motors, was developed during the occupation of France under the very noses of the Gestapo. The methods by which the plane was built in spite of the Gestapo are as secret as the plane's specifications. This plane represents France's bid for a place in post-war air commerce. France, a pioneer in aviation, stages a comeback in the world of flight. Others again sweep across the lakes of equatorial Africa with the traffic of Commonwealth relations and colonial affairs. And yet others, touching down where the hills of Hong Kong fall to the China Sea, carry to the farthest east the commerce of the Western world. However, although flying boats had provided admirable service during the war, the advent of the jet age and construction of new airports around the world soon rendered them obsolete. The era of luxury travel was coming to an end, and airlines focused on increasing passenger numbers rather than comfort. Gargantuan flying boats faded in popularity, and amphibious aircraft that could fly small loads became more sought after. As seaplanes became less widely used in the military because of the development of radar and helicopters, they found a niche as small-scale transport aircraft. Float planes, former land-based aeroplanes fitted with pontoons, were ideal for people living in remote locations where landing strips were difficult to build. Amphibious aeroplanes that could land on water or land also opened up previously inaccessible regions to tourism. Tourists could be flown into Canada's spectacular mountainous lake districts, Alaskan wilderness, and New Zealand's magnificent glacier lakes. The seaplane license is typically an add-on for someone who already has a conventional pilot's license. Float planes fly like a land-based plane, but are slower and less stable. One of the biggest issues for pilots is landing on completely still, glassy water, where it can be difficult to accurately gauge the depth. But the experience of a perfect water landing is greatly valued by many pilots. Float flying is not considered to be difficult to learn. Landings and takeoffs are comparatively simple in water areas that are generally large and traffic free. However, keep an eagle eye out for unexpected traffic. Once on the step, merely add power and accelerate for takeoff. When sufficient flying speed is attained, a very slight increase in back pressure will lift the aircraft cleanly off the water. But before landing on any river, it's a good idea to seek advice from local pilots. The current is fast, but there are areas of calm backwater. Since the current is fast on this river, it's advisable to step taxi to ensure directional control until out of the current. Unlike a glassy water landing where we operate close to the shore, you notice we stay well clear of the bank. 
Whether in Alaska or Florida, the techniques of float flying are similar. Today, amphibious aircraft are used for various specialized jobs. British-born adventurer Gerard Moss found a Lake Renegade 250 seaplane to be the perfect transportation for a voyage across Brazil to test the nation's waterways. The single-engine, boat-hulled amphibian was specially adapted to accommodate the requirements of this scientific research project. Moss planned to take water samples from a variety of waterways throughout the country, doing limited studies on board, with further analysis of the samples to be done by research scientists in a laboratory. The Brazil of the Waters project will be to travel from Rio de Janeiro, and every month a different region will be evaluated. There'll be 10 to 12 day flights, bringing back not just the data, but also the samples, so they can be analyzed in Rio de Janeiro, and also many aerial photographs of the area. The one-year study took advantage of the seaplane's ability to travel in diverse terrains. The most important thing is to take advantage of the efficiency of the plane that's being transformed into an aerial laboratory and to collect the most information possible, achieving in this way the picture of the health of the watercourses of Brazil. The project involved Moss flying a total of 100,000 kilometers, equivalent to two trips around the world. The adventurer and his Kenyan-born wife, Margie Moss, have lived in Brazil since the 1980s. And from 1989 to 1992, flew 120,000 kilometers to 50 countries around the world on their single-engine plane. And in Southeast Asia, an amphibious plane might be the answer to combating massive fires and subsequent haze that engulf the region every year. The amphibious plane has a unique ability in its role as an aerial firefighter. It requires only 12 seconds to scoop up more than 6,000 litres of water while skimming at high speed over any suitable water body. This enables it to make repeated sorties to forest fires in difficult and inaccessible areas without returning to an airfield, delivering 56,000 litres of water in an hour. Indonesia has been blamed for much of the smoke and haze that chokes the skies every year during the dry seasons. Illegal logging and land clearing by large conglomerates and subsistence farmers alike in the islands of Sumatra and Kalimantan is the main cause of these fires. Manufacturers of the Super Scooper feel they have found the perfect solution for the problem. Well, right now this plane is uh, the only plane in the world that's uniquely designed, specifically designed, for firefighting. It could certainly uh, have a major impact on the uh, frequent fires that you have in Indonesia. But Indonesia is still suffering from the lingering economic crisis in the region and might find it difficult to cough up the 25 million US dollar price tag for one plane. Uh, I'm not sure, because the airplane is maybe, for the presentation, the price is the expensive, and maybe my government not have uh, not enough money to buy the 20 million dollar for one, one set equipment for airplane. The Super Scooper has an impressive record and is in service throughout the United States and Canada, as well as in many European countries, including France, Greece, Italy and Spain. It remains to be seen if Indonesia will take the plunge or whether the choking smog that has been a real problem in recent years will once again sweep the region. Demonstrating the longevity of flying boats, 
A vintage float plane made a scheduled and picture book landing on the River Rhine in Cologne as part of festivities to commemorate 80 years of aviation in this western German city. The 60-year-old Dornier DO2380 T was flown by Irene Dornier, grandson of Claude Dornier, who in 1922 founded the plane-making company of the same name. Irene Dornier is on an extensive tour of the world with his float plane, looking for traces of the legendary DOX float plane that preceded Irene Dornier's model. The DOX first landed on the Rhine River in 1932, becoming a world sensation. Onlookers were enthusiastic and full of praise for both the beauty of the plane and the skills of the pilot. As an aviation fan, this is the best, watching a 60-year-old plane like that. The pilot did a superb job. It's a great plane with a lot of history involved. Fantastic. Crazy, I've never seen anything like it before. It was impressive. It was definitely worth the trip, despite the wonderful weather right now. And as the vintage Dornier sweeps down over the Rhine and settles on the waters, it brings a reminder of all the magnificent float planes that have inspired the world over the past century.